Good morning and welcome to the Landscapes of Slavery, Landscapes of Freedom conference. If I may have the title of my introduction, please. Thank you. In his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folk, W.E.B. Du Bois described how a black man's yearning for inclusion in the polity of white America could more readily be fulfilled among the scholars and intellectuals of generations past than in the midst of his own peers. I sit with Shakespeare, Du Bois observed, and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out of the caves of evening that swing between the strong limbed earth and the tracery of stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius and what soul I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn nor condescension. So wet with truth, I dwell above the veil. Is this the life you grudge us, O nightly America? The space above the veil Du Bois contemplated inhabiting weightlessly was one without racism or segregation, a space that seemed to exist only on the written page, where pure thought would be unconstrained by the material limitations imposed by the other side of the color line. Du Bois was a well-known sociologist, historian, civil rights activist and prof prolific author Recently, his writings have been discovered also by environmental humanities scholars and scholars interested in eco-criticism, who maintain that books like The Souls of Black Folk belong to the same shelf as those of Harry David Thoreau, John Muir, Aldo Leopold, and others. In the essay of Beauty and Death, included in the semi-autobiographical -auto work Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil, published in 1920, Du Bois recounted the experience of a cross-country road trip that took him from the Rocky Mountains to Acadia Na National Park. His lyrical rendering of the steep and rugged precipices of the Grand Canyon, which he describes as, I quote, a sudden void in the bosom of the earth, whose depth is carved by the Colorado River, a dull and sullen flood gushing forth as if from a wound, invoked the visual images of the Hudson River School's painters of the sublime. But they also summoned the memory of the Bard, the mid 18th century poem by Thomas Gray, in which the landscape is attributed human features that participate in the passions of the sole survivor of the, of the Welsh Bards during the apocryphal slaughter at the hands of Edward I. Such affinities place Du Bois squarely at the center of a long tradition of writers on the sublime from Longinus in ancient Greece to Robert Smithson in the 20th century. Du Bois was also well versed in the genre of the picturesque tour, which has a long history in landscape writings. In fact, the rhetoric of the tour he employed in the souls of black folk to evoke the atmosphere of the rural South. The question then is, why are Du Bois's writings also part of the landscape architecture canon? And what veils has the discipline erected that have compartmentalized a scholar like Du Bois away from a field that has historically engaged in debates with philosophers, designers, artists, and even clerics about the nature of the sublime and the question of, the, of its distinction from the decidedly more designer-friendly aesthetic of the picturesque. If we were to expand this inquiry, we would also notice how the black landscapes of slavery and freedom rarely emerge, if they emerge at all, in landscape architecture historiography. In order to understand why this is the case, we need to allow ourselves, however uncomfortably, to examine what we do and why, where our discipline comes from, and more importantly, whether it is time to lift the veil or veils and do our part to erase the color line. It is fitting that this inquiry should begin at Harvard because it is here that the first landscape architecture program in the country was launched more than 120 years ago with Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. at its helm. But in addition to practice self-reflection, it's useful to ponder just how complex the black landscape of the African diaspora and Afro-descendants is and what kind of expertise, sources and research methods are needed in order to tell its story. In this regard, a look at the biographies of our speakers suggests that to attempt to do this story justice, we need to engage in a dialogue with archaeologists, anthropologists, 
uh, scholars of history and specialists of African-American history, his literary scholars and artists and descendants among others, each one of them offering a different perspective, each one of them allowing us to piece together one side of the coin. The other side of this American coin, that is, is the landscape of white America, itself inclusive of foreign trends, which is the subject of copious design literature. I use the term design here to highlight the fact that landscape architecture has always been, since, it, since its inception as a profession and academic field in the early 20th century, a self-proclaimed design discipline, and as such, its historiography reflects this primary mandate. After replacing Olmsted Jr. as chair of the landscape department at Harvard in 1906, James Sturgis Prey wrote, I quote, the point of view of our instruction is that of a fine art, an art of design, in the practice of which the materials used are subordinated to the principles of their arrangement, end quote. Perhaps unwittingly, Prey's definition of the art of design embodied the conviction that landscape architects make neither landscapes nor gardens. At best, they make drawings and models of them by means of which they perfect the principles of their arrangements, that is, their composition. This is an idea that landscape architecture borrowed from architecture, and in fact, prior to 1906, the two disciplines were taught within the same department. In architectural theory, a concept of design was articulated as early as 1485, when Leon Battista Alberti wrote in his De Re Edificatoria that drawings and models are tools employed by designers during the trial and error phase of their creative process, which eventually leads to the layout of a building. The distancing of the creative act from the building's construction allowed for the abstraction of form from matter, whereby form could be studied at the drafting table and materials could be cho chosen thereafter. Interestingly, Alberti was not the first to articulate the, this possibility, as the distinction between form and matter had already appeared, albeit in embryo, in a 14th century work of fiction by Giovanni Boccaccio called The Decameron. Along with his contemporary Francesco Petrarca and Dante before him, Boccaccio was one of the Italian literati who elevated the use of the volgare, that is the Italian vernacular spoken by common people, to the august place Latin had occupied amongst men of letters of previous generations. A century later, perhaps unsurprisingly, Alberti did the exact opposite with his architectural treatise. He wrote it in Latin because his intention was to promote the position of architecture to the rank of a liberal art. In fact, by addressing not only architects and craftsmen, but also princes and patrons, Alberti claimed for the architect a high position in the social fabric of the early Renaissance. This is probably why he also decided not to provide his treatise with images, which were considered as pleasing the eyes of the ignorant more than those of the learned, an opinion first expressed again by Boccaccio in the Decameron. While Alberti adapted to architecture the theoretical dignity of classical rhetoric in the last quarter of the 15th century, it would take garden makers almost 150 years to make the same claim. This occurred when the Sienese Jesuit, Giovanni Battista Ferrari, published his treatise on garden design, The Florum Cultura, in Rome in 1633. Although similar ideas about the use of drawings and drawing techniques for the composition of form prior to the selection of plants, can be found in an unpublished mid-16th century manuscript by Agostino de Riccio, a Dominican monk. Unlike his predecessor, who inserted his ideas about garden design in a dissertation about agriculture, Ferrari considered the design of gardens as a new discipline, which he named garden architecture because it shared architecture's design tools. But another point of similarity between architecture and garden architecture, which was not commented upon explicitly, was the fact that both disciplines appealed to wealthy clients. Alberti's De Re Edificatoria included a letter written by the poet Angelo Poliziano to Lorenzo il Magnifico, and the first Latin edition of the Florum Cultura was dedicated to the powerful cardinal Francesco Barberini, one of the Pope's nephews. Of course, the fact that the design disciplines whose working principles were spelled out in Latin were brought to the attention of wealthy patrons in the early modern period doesn't mean that prior to that time, the arts of building and planting gardens didn't exist. But it does mean that before a design theory began to be articulated in writing 
Building and garden making were indebted to vernacular practices where the creative and implementation processes were intertwined and inseparable, where the productive was also pleasing, where matter dictated form rather than the other way around, and where the secrets of the craft were handed down from one generation to another in the form of all oral and slowly evolving traditions. With the emergence of design theory, the stonemason became an architect and the garden maker, who was typically also a fontaniere or hydraulic engineer, sometimes also a plant collector, a painter or a sculptor, he became a designer. And once the designer's new professional status was recognized and accepted by society's elite, the practice of self-promotion began. The first and most successful architect to advertise his own work is, as is well known, Andrea Palladio, who compiled the woodcuts of his own designs and published them in 1570 in a book called I Quattro Libri dell'Architettura. The book functioned as a modern day design portfolio with the added bonus of explanatory text that helped popularize Palladio's insights into classical architecture and his translation of the latter into a modern architectural syntax. The latter appealed to the Venetian oligarchy at a time in which the latter was interested in the crafting of a new self-image. Architects and amateurs aspiring to become such, from Lord Burlington to Thomas Jefferson, used the book to teach themselves the principles of good design. Palladio's design theory was easily applicable, which explains the success of the Quattro Libri across the Channel and the Atlantic, a success that also secured Palladio's permanent place in the Olympus of early modern historiography. Like Palladio in the Quattro Libri, garden designer Stephen Switzer published his own work in the Iconografia Rustica in 1718, promising his audience, I quote, directions from the, for the general distribution of a country seat into rural and extensive gardens, parks, paddocks, etc., and the general system of agriculture. All of this is illustrated from the author's own drawings." End quote. But unlike the Quattro Libri, Switzer's Iconographia also included a section titled History of Gardening, which was less an objective account of historical developments than an attempt to engage in stylistic propaganda. Switzer conveniently forgot, for example, the name of his French colleague André Lenotre, whose style he presented as rather outdated in contrast with his own, which was said to reflect, I quote, the greatness of mind that reigns in the English nobility and gentry, end of quote. Subsequent landscape histories emerged that offered asserted versions of designers' propaganda imbued with nationalistic pride. Landscape history broke free from the claims of current fashions only when designers began to replace self-promotion self with cultural relativism, a change that first emerged in the writings of Scottish botanist, garden designer and historian John Claudius Loudon, the author of the impressive Encyclopedia of, garden, of Gardening, published in 1822. Loudon's garden history had no rival until well into the 20th century, when contributors to garden and landscape history came not only from the world of design or horticulture and medicine, as had been the case earlier, but also from a variety of other fields, such as history, art history, geography, and literature. The fresh perspectives brought by these disciplines expanded the interpretive lens used to attribute meanings to forms. So, for example, the new narratives analyzed gardens as images of transcendence, the garden as a symbol of paradise, and then in the 21st centuries as allegories of power. But despite this broadening of meanings and scholarly lenses, the main focus of most investigations has been the design landscape, which is very often the landscape of the elite. This doesn't mean, of course, that designers have always ignored the vernacular, but the cases in which we can say that they have not are very few, and such cases very rarely enter historical analysis. Students of architecture and landscape architecture, for example, will not remember Palladio for his gardens. Yet, Palladio's most well-known projects are villas, perfectly positioned like jewels in the midst of, of the horizontal Venetian countryside. Apart from a mid-20th century essay by amateur garden historian Georgina Masson, and later the seminal study of the Palladian landscape by cultural geographer Dennis Cosgrove, Palladius, Palladius gardens have attracted little attention, especially if compared with the volume of writings addressing the landscape gardens gracing 18th century new Palladian country houses in England. The main reason for this omission has to do with the fact that Palladius gardens were not the product of design, they were rather vernacular brawly, that is, productive orchards, 
not dissimilar from those found elsewhere in the Veneto region. There were also no less gardens than their design cousins, however, but they were planted and implemented on site, not at the drawing table. Palladio himself didn't say much about them in his treaties, other than reporting the self-evident truth that they ought to be planted in the adjacency of the villa grounds. He didn't spell out for his audience what design principles vernacular orchards might contain. Unlike Palladio, uh, Gertrude Jekyll, the English garden designer and artist who set out to document the innate beauty of vernacular cottage gardens in Surrey, which in the mid 19th century were at risk of being lost to development, she distilled from them an aesthetic, uh, the aesthetic principles she later incorporated into her planting design theories. And these theories have been celebrated by historians of the English flower border ever since. Given these precedents, it would be useful to consider whether the writings of Du Bois may not have attracted the attention of landscape historians because the picturesque rhetoric he adopted in the souls of black folk is not that of design theorists and improvers like Overdale Price and Richard Payne Knight, who urged, who urged landowners to reshape their estates along picturesque lines, but it is rather that of William Gilpin and Sir Walter Scott, who aimed not to redesign, but to bring the rural landscape to the attention of everyday visitors. Du Bois found his, this version of the picturesque useful because its aesthetic of roughness and irregularity offered the syntax with which he could bestow value to marginal lands and marginalized people. Moreover, it was an aesthetic that valued a scenery of changing prospects over commanding ones and was addressed not to enterprising landowners, but to travelers seeking a fleeting acquaintance with scenes over which, and this is the crucial difference, they had no control. It is fitting in this context to remember that William Gilpin himself was ridiculed by later generations of improving designers who attributed the ruggedness the reverend sought in the natural landscape to what they thought was his own unsophisticated persona. Gilpin laid the groundwork for a certain way of looking at the landscape. Um, sorry, Gilpin, who laid the groundwork uh, for a certain way of looking at the landscape, was not a designer and suffered the consequences of a tribalistic tendency that emerges now and then in landscape architecture, one that pits one group of specialists against another and that separates and isolates us and them behind veils. This tendency is, of course, not unique to landscape architecture. It is an unfortunate sort of cultural heritage we carry from the Stone Age and which we have not yet been able to shrug off. A different philosopher tourist, a 20th century kind, perhaps blessed with a more receptive audience of designers uh, than Gilpin, was J.B. Jackson, who taught landscape history at the GSD. In the, 15th, in the 1950s and 60s, he was the editor of the journal Landscape, whose mission was to teach its audience how to read the geography of prosaic landscapes and architectures, in other words, how to see the vernacular, the, uh, how to see the vernacular uh, built environment. In the book Landscape Insight, Looking at America, Jackson wrote, I quote, the older I grow and the longer I look at landscapes, the more convinced I am that their beauty is not simply an aspect, but their very essence, and that the beauty derives, that beauty derives from the human presence, end quote. Jackson thought that design students could learn as much from the grand scale, man-made landscape of bold lines embodying the wish to control nature and express status, which he aptly termed the political landscape, as they could from the landscape of anonymity, that is, a landscape reflecting the continual and incremental adjustment to circumstances and habits developed over time. The consideration Jackson afforded to the vernacular landscape did not, however, extend to the gardens and landscapes of black folk, even though it opened the door for subsequent investigations. We have to wait until 1992 for a monograph to be dedicated entirely to the vernacular landscape of African-American gardens and yards, particularly those in the rural South. The author, Richard Westmacott, used the methods of oral history and the surveying skills learned through his landscape architecture training to record and describe the gardens and garden making activities of black communities in Georgia, South Carolina and Alabama. In reviewing the book, landscape historian John Nixon Hunt lamented the rather cursory attention the author paid to the African background of his gardeners and to the question of what modes were inherited from that continent. 
this shortcoming Hunt ascribed to the fact that landscape architecture was not, I quote, a field noted for its interest in historical, conceptual, let alone theoretical inquiries, end quote. His criticism reflecting perhaps the discipline's incipient amnesia about its origins. In an effort to tear down the veil separating designers from historians, and in so doing recover a long tradition of designer writers, Hunt convened a symposium on the vernacular garden that brought together not only historians from a variety of disciplines, but also practicing landscape architects. This effort resulted in an anthology Hunt co-edited with Joachim Wolfke Bullmann, himself a landscape architect and editor. The conference proceedings published in 1993 were only the second anthology on the vernacular landscape after J.B. Jackson's own collection from 1984. And in fact, the anthology opened with an essay penned by Jackson himself. In it, the self-made cultural geographer explained that the vernacular garden is a garden, quote, devoted to work and productivity entirely without formal design, where by the qualifier formal, he referred to, des to the design process and not to actual geometric forms. Each vernacular garden, Jackson continued, is the product of local traditions, local climate, and of local economic and agricultural influences. He was not surprised that there was not yet a history of the American vernacular garden because in the United States from the mid 19th century onward, I quote, the garden was thought of in terms of design, not in terms of productivity, that was left to the farm, end quote. Jackson also noted that, I quote, much attractive literature has been written about the handsome gardens of the Virginia plantations and those of the well-to-do merchants of Philadelphia and New England but I suspect that the only truly vernacular gardens in colonial America, gardens which supplemented the food produced in the fields, were those of the black slaves, end quote. And he referred the reader to the chapter by Richard Westmacott in the same volume. The goal of his research, wrote Westmacott at the beginning of his essay, was to demonstrate, a quote, that the vernacular garden is one from which the owner derives pleasure from actually working in it and making changes, end quote. He clarified that the Afro-American vernacular garden is not one devoted only to the functions of raising vegetables and carrying out mundane chores, because a pension from or for ornament and display was, I quote, even in times of the severest depression, a constant feature of these gardens. Well, while he could not resist searching for traces of design intentions in the gardens of the black folks he interviewed and in their musings, looking for evidence of a partiality to symmetry, for example, which was not confirmed, or noting the absence of a structural use of plants or the lack of any external influence from magazines or even from television, West McCott concluded that the charm of these gardens resided in an aesthetic that was neither visual nor superficial, but consisted in the embodiment of three main features, self-sufficiency, plenty, and generosity. Self-sufficiency is reflected in the pride of being able to say, I eat what I make and I make what I eat. Plenty is the awareness that the hard work of cultivation and raising livestock ultimately provides more food than a family may need. And lastly, generosity is the pride of being able to share the garden's beauty with the community and its bounty with whomever may need it beyond the immediate family of the gardener. Ultimately, the vernacular garden ontology was well received, particularly for its perceived usefulness to an audience of designers. Noting the habit of repurposing any discarded or disused object in the garden from colorful glass bottles to tractor tires forming raised beds for shrubs and herbaceous plants, West Macot commanded the incredible resourcefulness of black gardeners who were able, with creative improvisation, to make something practically from nothing. Art historian Michael Charlesworth, who reviewed the anthology for Landscape Journal, the official publication of the American Society of Landscape Architects, opined that rediscovering the vernacular would help designers' creativity and offer a remedy to those in the grip of clients mediocre, with mediocre taste. I quote, never has the inquiry into designs of garden, into the doings of garden makers at the grassroots been more urgent for the design professions when it has become alarmingly apparent that the landscape architectural profession seems bent on showing itself fit only to pander to the worst type of middle of the roadism. And when the wealthy in society seem able to think only in terms of commissioning works that amount 
to what Jan Hamilton Finlay has characterized as caution at all costs, free conformism, end quote. While Charles Wolf welcomed the, the decision of landscape historians and designers to write about fall gardens, he also took the editors to task for giving the impression, I quote, of the elite picking around the subject with kid gloves on, having to justify this latest endeavor by reference to interest in non-canonical texts in the humanities, end quote. Charles Worth suggested that the, editor, that the editors likening their deliberations on the vernacular garden in their introduction to, I quote, the study of astrology by historians of science or of Quakery by medical historians, end quote, was nothing short of patronizing. But Charles Worth himself referred to vernacular gardens as low-level doings, an unfortunate choice of words which signals, on the one hand, the, desi the desire to explore the vernacular as a useful curiosity and as, a, and, a and as a panacea for the floundering creativity of designers, and on the other, the reluctance to allow the vernacular the dignity of its own identity and meaning. These attributes echo the ridicule that picturesque was exposed to in this country among persons of education in the mid-19th century, when it stopped being the style of choice of the elite who could afford the services of a designer and gave rise to its own version of suburban white vernacular, especially after being popularized by Andrew Jackson Downing. As J.B. Jackson implied, the vernacular version of the picturesque disappeared behind a veil of intolerance. Obviously, the veil was still up in the last decade of the 20th century. In the 21st century, few studies of various forms of vernacular landscapes have been published, some of them included in accounts of indigenous community gardens, and some as part of investigations into landscapes of ritual. None of these studies were reviewed by landscape design journals, however. A resurfacing of designers' interest toward both the vernacular and specifically the black vernacular occurred just a few months ago when UVA Press published an anthology titled Black Landscapes Matter, which takes inspiration from the social movement for black lives and was edited by landscape architect Walter Hood. In the volume, distinguished professor of landscape architecture Coffee Boone asks, I quote, mainstream landscape architecture history, theory and practice relegates the critical black landscape to historic preservation, cultural anthropology and archeology. span Why can they not be read as landscape architecture, end quote. The answer to Professor Boone's question, however, is in the book itself and in his own text. Boone reports the remarks of cinematographer Arthur Jaffa, who, I quote, characterized the breadth of black expression as grounded in the spectrum between the sacred and the profane, making no distinction between high and low cultural practices. Jaffa observed that the innovative and avant-garde creative expressions present across black popular, popular media culture, music and fashion indicate that the spirit driving the making of powerful artifacts is as strong as ever. He made a point, however, of excluding architecture and by extension landscape architecture from this phenomenon. In Jaffa's mind, the built environment professions do not operate in the same area as other creative traditions. The level of education, low exposure of the professions to black and brown communities, and the difficulties involved in generating the necessary capital to create a building or a landscape are all barriers, end quote. Boone ponders whether it may not be time, I quote, to begin a radical rethink of the profession, end quote. While not addressing how the profession might be rethought, his contribution centers on proving that black landscapes matter, and in order to matter, they first need to be seen which is the main argument made by all contributors to the volume. Incidentally, seeing is what landscape architects do best. Landscape architects use plans, sections, and various visual renderings to examine the potential for a place to be transformed into something else. The landscape architect's drawings are recollections of what is already there, what has been, and projections of what is yet to come. While the end goal used to be purely aesthetic, design now takes into consideration what is not immediately visible, the ecosystems in which we intervene, the need for biodiversity. Landscape architects collaborate with a wide variety of specialists, from horticulturalists to soil scientists to conservation biologists, to name a few. Theirs is the role of an orchestra conductor who is able to create harmony out of many instruments. The only thing the orchestra conductor doesn't do, however, is play. And landscape architects may orchestrate, 
but they do not make landscapes. And perhaps this is worth reflecting on. J.B. Jackson noted that when that what we must look for in the vernacular garden are precisely those qualities which the expensive and professionally designed landscape rejects. And in order to be able to appreciate the vernacular landscape, he argued, we must first try to discover the personal involvement in its making, maintenance and use. While pictures of black bodies appear in this most recent effort by designers to recover the African-American landscape, black voices from the community are missing. If they weren't, perhaps they would be able to answer Professor Boone's question of what might designers and planners learn from the Black Lives Matter movement, especially from the latter's focus, focus on the black body. In the absence of more recent voices, it's useful to return to the interviews of the black gardeners Richard Westmacott recorded in the early 1990s. Even when emphasis changed from subsistence to decoration, the garden was never purely for leisure much less was it an object of aesthetic appreciation consumed from a window or from afar. Much of the satisfaction derived from the garden, Westmacott noted, comes from working in it and watching things grow, anticipating changes and planning, and planning how to adjust to them. Many gardeners spoke of the pleasure they derived from watching the garden. Watching is the crucial difference here, not looking at it. Watching something grow means witnessing the reward of hard work, patient acceptance of change and resourcefulness. That is the essential beauty of the vernacular, something that can neither be appreciated visually nor in an, in, in an in instant. It must be lived. And if it's not, it's easy to dismiss. It's not surprise that the most consistent progress in the study of African-American gardens has been made by the Southern Garden History Society, a group founded by garden historians in 1982 to promote scholarship of historical horticulture the history of southern gardens and landscapes, their preservation and restoration. The Society is an outgrowth of the Restoring Southern Gardens and Landscapes Biennial Conferences launched in 1979 and running until 2019. The conferences were not only a forum for the presentation of new scholarship, but also the occasion for hands-on workshops led by gardeners, horticulturists, and restoration practitioners who would address the wide variety of gardening issues encountered in the study of historical landscapes from extinct, from extinct plants and historic bulbs to planting tools, and from the influence of Native Americans on Southern landscapes to pests and historic remedies against them. What was special here was the society's understanding that in order to restore a garden, you first need to know how it was made, and that requires the humility of climbing inside the skin of those who have come before and walk around in it for a while. This melange of high-level scholarship and grassroots interest in landscape poiesis allow the society not only to see black bodies, but also investigate their agency and meanings. What emerges from the oral and written sources on the black landscape is that it's molded by a direct engagement in cultivation, an activity that requires knowledge accumulated through, through experience and understanding of soils and soil fertility, the ability to recognize plants from the wild, collect them and discern where they, they want to be planted. And lastly, an empirical knowledge of sustainable gardening and farming. Already decades ago, the practices of West Macaute's interviewees were beginning to be affected by the improvements of white society, which introduced tools like the gasoline powered mower and pesticides. Black gardeners' knowledge of land cultivation must have been impacted by their time in captivity when they were forced to implement the unsustainable farming practices mandated by their enslavers. As West Macaute observed, I quote, Many planters came from countries where soil fertility was maintained by mixed rotational farming systems that also enabled the workload to be spread throughout the year. But most saw no need to conserve soil fertility with plentiful land to the West, and the labor constraint was solved by slavery." End quote. Africans and Afro-Americans, I quote, were introduced to carry out, where, sorry, were instructed to carry out farming practices which they may have known to be, or at least suspected, of being destructive. Historians have been able to ascertain that in coastal Georgia, for example, the enslaved knew intimately the convoluted salt creeks and canals, which they navigated whenever possible to sell, to sell their own crops and handiwork. And they relished their understanding of hydraulic technology, sporadically sabotaging the control efforts of plantation overseers. While commenting on the African interior in his 1770 account of the European settlements in America, 
Edmund Bjork remarked too that the natives, I quote, are better observers, observers of times and seasons and draw better rules from them than more civilized and reasoning people. In other words, they seem to be able to possess more wisdom about the local, their local conditions than many of their educated colonizers. Professor Boone wants the enslaved at Middleton Plantation in South Carolina to be seen as landscape architects. But landscape architects today discuss how to best tackle climate change, how to make landscapes resilient, how to combat desertification, how to make cities biodiverse. In other words, how to address the very problems created by white society. We could say that these problems have enslaved designers who, were dis who have distanced themselves so much from the mundane practices of cultivation, including the cultivation of their own history, that they forgot in 2003 to commemorate the centennial of Olmsted's death. This forum doesn't have any other agenda other than contributing to the landscapes and living places of the African diaspora and Afro descendants. Excuse me. Spaces of bondage and of ever receding freedoms. Not because of what they might do for us, but mainly because of what we might learn from them, in hopes that when the next landscape architect sits with a black gardener, she, like Shakespeare, will win not. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jarvis McInnes, and I am an assistant professor of English at Duke University. Um, I want to begin by thanking uh, Rafaela uh, for uh, that beautiful um, um, introduction and really setting the setting the scene uh, for uh, our discussion uh, for the next couple of days. Um, and a special thanks to Rafaela as well for inviting me to participate in this exciting conference. Um, I am a scholar of African American and African diaspora literature and culture, and I'm currently uh, at work on my first book manuscript entitled uh, Afterlives of the Plantation, which explores cultural, political, and intellectual linkages uh, between Southern African American and Caribbean writers, artists, and intellectuals in the early 20th century. So I'm especially excited uh, to be a part of today's um, conversation. Um, I have the honor of introducing uh, our um, first set of presenters uh, for this morning's first panel. Um, our first presenter uh, is Anne Bowie. Uh, Anne Bowie was born in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, she grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and was deeply affected by the beauty and culture she experienced during summers on her grandparents' farm in Florida. Her, fam her family lived in six states and she had attended seven schools by the fifth grade before settling in Riverside, California, where, where she grew up and eventually graduated from the University of California there. She left Southern California and moved to the Bay Area to enter the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University, where she earned a PhD in administration and policy analysis, a master's degree in secondary education, and a master's degree in African American history. As a mixed media assemblage artist, Ms. Bowie has exhibited at the Hunfleur Gallery, Gallery Murtis, the Nevin Kelly Gallery, Millennium, uh, uh, excuse me, Millennium Salon, uh, and the DC Art Center. She has also participated in exhibits in California, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and India. She is a member of the Black Arts of DC, uh, the Millennium Arts Salon, Washington, D.C. Friends of Brandywine and the Women's Caucus for the Arts, uh, the Hunfleur Gallery, the Washington Arts Project, and the Pen and Brush Gallery in New York. Uh, her presentation uh, today is entitled Hoeing, Harvesting, Healing, and Hexing, the Earth and its Cultivation as Tools of Resistance to Enslavement. And I'll go ahead and present and introduce our second uh, presenters um, or co-presenters. Uh, they are uh, James French and Matthew Reeves. Uh, James French founded the Montpelier Descendants Committee and joined the board of the Montpelier Foundation in 2019. The MDC educates the public about the social, intellectual, and economic con contributions to the nation's founding of enslaved Americans across central Virginia, uh, including at James Madison's plantation, Montpelier. Uh, 
Mr. French strenuously advocated for power sharing to a largely resistant board and led the MDC in achieving structural parity with the Montpelier Foundation by innovating a widely applicable model for resolving legacy power imbalances in organizations. The MDC is the only descendant organizational, uh, excuse me, organization to establish itself as an equal co-steward and has worked in international banking, government, and in entrepreneurial roles across the globe. Mr. French is launching a fintech startup focused on emerging economies in Africa and beyond. Um, Mr. French's uh, co-presenter is Matthew Reeves, uh, who is the director of archaeology at James Madison's Montpelier in Orange, Virginia. His specialty is sites of the African diaspora, including plantation and freedmen period sites and, and the Civil War. In his 20 years at Montpelier, Reeves has developed a strong public archaeology program known for its citizen science approach to research. At the heart of this program is community-based research with a heavy focus on investing descendant communities in the research and interpretation process and governance of cultural institutions. He has also led the, archeo the archeological discipline in devising new ways to engage metal detector hobbyists and archeological survey through his department's work uh, locating the living and work sites of the enslaved community across the 2,700 acre Montpelier property. These new site discoveries hold the future for Montpelier, continuing to tell the story of the enslaved community. Uh, James and Matthew's presentation is entitled Forgotten Witnesses, Exploring Archaeological Sites of Labor at a Presidential Plantation. Uh, first, we will have um, a presentation by, by Anne Bowie, and then we will move on to James and Matthew's presentations, and then we will uh, uh, have a bit of discussion uh, between the uh, four of us, and then we'll open the floor for discussion. So please feel, feel free to begin to write your comments um, in, the, in the chat. Thank you so much, and um, looking forward to our discussion shortly. Uh, good morning, and I want to echo uh, Michael Twitty's thoughts uh, last evening about what an honor it is to be here. I want to thank uh, Rafaela and Matt and Kit, Kat and Paige for their support and their expertise. I'd like to thank all of those seen and unseen who guide us in this work, who appreciate this work, and for whom on, on whose behalf we are doing this work. I live in Washington, D.C. and have had the pleasure of meeting and cultivating relationships with a number of elders who came to D.C. from the South uh, and who remember their legacies and uh, have wonderful storytelling capabilities. Several of them have allowed me to interview them and talk with them about their experiences and even have over time, we have dialogued with my research and their experiences and the oral traditions that they carry. Uh, one of these gentlemen is Mr. Perkins. Mr. Perkins is 94 years old, and as he likes to say, he's got everything that he was born with except his teeth. He gardens, he does not use a cane. He can be seen in his yard most days of the week watching things grow and tending and caring for things. Another friend, Mr. Willie, uh, whom we affectionately call Mr. Willie, introduced me to Mr. Perkins and warned me that Mr. Perkins was extremely opinionated and had no problem in sharing his feelings, observations, and thoughts. And I've come to see him as an everyman in every sense of the word. Uh, along the lines of a rural Lawrence Ferlinghetti, for example, who was a longshoreman but wrote poetry. Um, and so as Mr. Uh, Willie was kind enough to introduce me to him, as I've shared with you, um, I was so excited about meeting him. And uh, Mr. Perkins is sitting on his porch. He's got an old uh, corn cob pipe and a big glass of lemonade that I suspect is spiked with uh, white lightning that he still brews in his basement. And he says, well, young lady, 
Mr. Willie says that even though you've been to school and you got one of them PPDs or whatever they call them, you still got a little common sense and respect for your elders and what we might have to pass on. I don't have no time for foolishness, and every day I got left on the guard's good earth, I intend to enjoy it. Through talking with folks who come up asking me about how folk and house folk and field folk and slave drivers and whoopings and nighttime cabin visits and lynchings and suffering, I'm so tired about hearing and talking about all the suffering. Like that's all we did and how it just wore us out and broke us till we couldn't stand up straight. Does it look like I can't stand up straight to you? Do I look beat down and pitiful? Does I look like a grinning fool? Does I look like I got no home training, a reasonable portion of hope and strength, or does it look like I'm ready for a cooling bird? Why, I'm 94 years old and I got everything God gave me except my teeth. Who you think raised me and teach me, and she didn't get it from no white folk. So if you're going to talk about pitiful, suffering, beat down slaves, why are you talking about my mama, my daddy, my mama's money, and most everybody in the quarters? You think them folks was laying about, stealing everything that ain't nailed down and running away off like all by themselves. You think they got up and didn't take care of themselves and take care of each other and get through hard times? Who do you think taught them about those rivers and those streams and where to get the herbs to heal us? I have to admit, I was a little taken aback because I just wanted to sit down and talk. Um, and I said to myself, whoa, Mr. Willie didn't quite prepare me enough for this. He looks at me and takes a breath, and I say, says, well, I guess you got me a little riled up, child. And it's wrong to load up on you before I even get to hear from you. My dear friend said you were all right, so let's sit down and see what you're talking about. And I said, well, Mr. Perkins, I study resistance to enslavement on all fronts. The name of this work I'm doing is Healing, Hexing, and Hoeing. And it's about how we used the farm and how we used the land and each other to prevail against oppression and suffering. And he listened intently for a minute. And after I finished, he said, my, 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 that's a whole lot of 50 and 75 cent words for saying something you got there. Is that the way you all talk? I say, that's a whole lot of words just to say them Africans brought over rice and okra and peas and made them up some hoes and planted them and ate them and talked to the land and walked the land. And when things got sick, they went out to the woods and gathered up something and healed each other and looked to the old folks to tell them what to do. That's a lot of words for that. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Perkins, but it's what I've been trained to do. And so let me share with you a little bit here, Mr. Perkins, if I could. Um, geographer Otto Schull introduced the concept of cultural landscape as an area of academic study in the early 20th century. He defined two forms of landscape, the natural landscape that existed before human significant human action and the cultural landscape, a landscape created by human culture. Carl Sorrow further developed this concept in his classic paper, The Morphology of Landscape, where he presented his ideas for a non-determinist cultural geography incorporating time as an essential component. For Sauer, the forms of cultural landscape included all work of humanity that comprised a geographical landscape and uh, was shaped from a natural landscape by a cultural group where culture is the agent. The natural world is the context that influences, affects, and defines the interactions between the land and the people. The way people perceived and understood the concept of uh, the landscape was an essential aspect of culture. Since Schultz, uh first formal use of the term and Sauer's idea promoted it, prom uh, promoted it, there have been extrapolations and applications. For example, J.B. Johnson's Jackson's publication, Landscape, influenced a whole generation of scholars. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization defined cultural landscapes and developed an entire program celebrating the cultural landscapes created in profound settings of nature and the earth that describe the evolution of human society over time, and look, they have several definitions for defining cultural properties, all of which indicate the interaction between humans and the earth. Now, in discussing the, um, the National Park Service of the U.S. has a very appropriate description for us. They defined um, 
vernacular landscapes as those whose use, construction, or physical layout reflects academic tradi endemic traditions, customs, beliefs, or values, where the expression of cultural values, social behavior, and individual action are manifested in physical features and materials, including patterns of spatial organization, land use, circul circulation, vegetation, structures, and objects. The physical, biological, and cultural features reflect the customs and everyday lives of people, of uh, people, animals, subsistence, and ceremonial grounds. In other words, their values are manifested in the cultural landscape that they create within the context of the natural environment. In discussing the landscape of enslaved people, the notions of African concepts of space, place, and meaning invariably arise. When considering the cultural landscape, the question arises whose cultural premises were operative and just what was the nature of the cultural landscape they created. The literature and research rest upon the premise that African culture was deficient in every way and with what little of it there was, was destroyed during the Middle Passage. This left them rudderless, bereft in a new land, clutching desperately to the culture and ways of their enslavers. If not portrayed as tabula rosa, another significant trend arising from this moment conf uh, conflates African history and the history of slavery in colonial America. In nearly all of these foundations, uh, Africans become progressively more European in language, dress, religion, values, political outlook, and thought. Thus, cultural change, quote unquote, is bound in the colonizing of the Atlantic world. Though the intents of these scholars are perhaps trying to be post-colonial, they actually validate the very thing they are trying to fight. The sources upon which most of these studies relate are, if, are based on archives and interpretations of archives that have a, a vested interest in silencing the voices of the people about whom they write. Now, to uh, studies have by now unequivocally proved that to suggest that European lifeways acted as fundamentally transformative for those who became enslaved, not only exaggerates European impacts in Africa, it also reflects the notion that African-American culture begins with European forms. Studies have produced unassailable evidence that enslaved Africans preserved and sustained many cultural practices from their African homelands, sometimes in altered forms and passed along to younger people for generations. Scholars studying the contra, uh, cultural transformations of the African diaspora have found that even though Europeans may have wished to believe that the slave trade decultured Africans across the Atlantic, in truth, the Middle Passage actually transported a number of thought systems that fell outside the Eurocentric uh, rubric of civilization, including African cosmologies. And uh, Cedric Robinson, Ballard, and others explained that the Eurocentric mindset was unable to recognize most of the belief systems of African captives and dismiss those that they thought they saw, um, so that essential beliefs, of substantial elements of their belief and thought systems remain inaccessible and hence protected. Stuckey contended that the slave ships crossing the Atlantic were crucibles that helped forge a single people out of numerous African uh, ethnicities. This was a, an ongoing process beginning with the 400 mile treks from the inland of Africa to the coast, uh, to the barracoons and to the ships. On the ships, it continued in the Americas. And Michael Gomez indicates that actually the first cultural synthesis, if you will, was not between Africans and Europeans, but, be, but among Africans who uh, learned, who first had to uh, mix and blend their own worldviews into a common worldview upon recognition that being Wolof or being Igbo or being from Benin had nothing to do with the fact that they were all in shackles and that race and not ethnicity had become the common bond. And if I have 15 minutes remaining, which seems a horrible thing to be, I want to get to uh, the four areas of land. When we talk about gardening and the use of the land, I want to talk about the uh, 
a, st a study, a share that Mr. Uh, Perkins told me about with Mr. Willie. Now, he says that it was clear that it, anybody could see the rations alone wouldn't do it that we had to find some kind of way to feed ourselves and we needed to feed ourselves so we wouldn't be under the thumb of somebody who was trying to use food to control us. If somebody ran away, they wouldn't feed them. Mother got mad, they wouldn't feed them. And so our own food is what kept us alive. And we grew, we grew our food and we raised our food and the gardening was according to thinking about Miss Ellie, as a gardener, uh, walking through the quarters, she'd see Miss Ellie's farm. And they said, Miss Ellie was a healer. She was an elder and she was taught by her mother and her mother's mother and her great grandmama was from Africa. And they taught and trained and Miss Ellie was born with a veil over her face. And it was said that she had a star for a birthmark on her right hand. We all knew that her garden was special. She used to say she had two gardens. She had the one she planted and the one the Lord planted. And she knew both of those gardens intimately. The garden, her garden, she used to hum when she'd worked in it. We watched her talk to her plants and hum to her plants while she planted them. We used, when I got to go out into the woods with her to gather herbs, why she could read the landscape like a book. She could tell you what season a plant was growing in, what time to plant it, what time to pick it, why some plants had four or five different uses depending on when she would pick them and when she would gather them and how she would fix them. She'd tell me it was always important to plant on the moon. Don't ever plant a new crop when the moon is darkest. Roots are not going to grow. You want to plant it when the sap is running and when the roots are up. Uh, they said she could make rivers rise and she could see as clear in the dark as you and me could see in the day. She had roots and weeds and flowers growing all over her house. She told me that some of the plants from the woods would, would grow at home with her. Some of them were not having it. That meant she had to know where to get what and when to get it. And she had all of this knowledge in her head for healing and for comforting and for doing. Sometimes when uh, somebody it was somebody got child got sold or somebody got sick, or somebody got hurt, she was the one who was there. And I remember one time when John Lee had a horrible whipping, horrible, and they brought him to Miss Ellie's house. She laid him on his stomach and she started humming and healing and rubbing him with one of those poultices that she makes. She said it was mullein and honey and a little bit of bear root and, she, and a little bit of summer wine that she made. She rubbed it all together with some oil and just kept rubbing his back and humming a tune that sounded familiar, but that we didn't know and brought that man's soul back together and his body together. I saw it for myself. Miss Ellie was treasured among us and not only was she treasured, nobody missed with her and nobody crossed her. That includes the white folks. In fact, you could see them sneak into her cabin after dark to get some help for themselves. She said, now the thing about healing is you have to know it doesn't just affect you. And it's not out of this. It's a, it's a, my gift is a gift from the good Lord. My mama had it and I had it. And that gift is what makes me able to heal. I'm just a vessel and I'm just a vessel for the good Lord to use. And I got these gifts and I have the sense to go out into the wilderness and just sit. I got my little special spot out there that I just goes and sits. And I pray and I rock and all of a sudden the Lord is showing me this and showing me that. You see, it's a spiritual thing. Some of those folks go get books and go get manuscripts and all of this. But unless the spirit is involved in it, you're not going to get well. You're not going to be whole. And all of us have to be whole here in the quarters. Now, <clears throat> in the quarters where Miss Ellie walked and laid, worked, you had not only Miss Ellie, but you had Dr. Sandy. Now, Dr. Sandy was a descendant of that Dr. Sandy that worked with Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass is all educated and going around the world and all of this. But you know how he got his start. You remember he had run off to the woods because he was 
get tired of getting beat and was getting threatened to get beat again. And who walks along but Uncle Sa Dr. Sandy and says, I got something that can help you. Now, let me tell you what to do. And of course, he's not going to tell us all. But we all knew that Dr. Sandy was a conjure man and that he might not uh, go out and gather all the herbs that Miss Ellie did, but he knew what he needed to do, what he needed to do. He also had some stuff that didn't anybody want to talk about because it was strange and because you just didn't want to know. But he told, he said, now, uh, he went out into the woods himself and he gathered a little of this and a little of that and he put it in a little pile and he put, sewed it up in a little red pouch sort of like and stole Frederick. Now you put this in your right side pocket, not your left, your right side pocket. And you say a little prayer, son, and I guarantee you that you won't get whooped anymore. Now, we all know the story that Frederick got full of himself and jumped on his uh, enslaver, but he never got beat again. And as Frederick became more worldly and erudite, he said, no, I just really don't want to believe what happened because that contradicts science. But I know that it happened. And so conjurers, conjurers, and healers always told you a book learning is all right but what you can't learn from the earth has not been written what you can't learn from the land has not been i don't need no almanac to read the, the what the weather is saying me and what the times is saying me i used to watch miss ellie she could tell you when we were going to have a hard winter because the squirrel's fur coat got thicker because the ant hills changed they read the earth and lived the earth in Miss Ellie's garden, there was a sacred spot and there was some little configurations of rocks and stones the way she did. And I said, I wanted her to tell me about those, but she said, not yet, son. What I know now is that what was in her garden was some African symbols that she's been carrying since her great grandma. Her mama told her about. So it's this little circle and it had a cross in it. And it was very interesting because people walked by and say, oh, Miss Ellie's so holy. And look at that. And they had no idea that it was African, had no idea. And so right there in plain sight, the way she had the stones arranged in her yard, sometimes she painted them white. And right there in plain sight, they used to say she kept her yard so clean and swept and beautiful. Why they didn't know that that, sweet, that swept yard was about cleanliness was about protection, was about a prelude into people coming into her yard. She had a vegetable garden and her herb garden and her sister, Miss Lizzie, had the most beautiful flowers that you could ever see. Sometimes Miss Lizzie said she didn't even get to keep any flowers because people came around and she just felt so good about sharing them with everybody that came around. And Miss Ellie, she'd give out tonics she'd give out nice little patches of her vegetables. And the sharing of it made people feel so good because they had corn and millet and they were growing lettuce and they were growing melons and she was going greens, grew the most beautiful collards you ever want to see. And they always thought it was funny and didn't quite know where they got it from that the slaves depended on some fat back and some hard corn for their food. Why people went hunting way out in the woods early in the morning, late at night. And I'll tell you one thing about those woods and, uh, and the way we met them. I heard about this young man, William Bell. He heard his enslaver was getting ready to sell him off. He said, oh, no, it's a 10-year-old boy. And he ran out into the woods. Don't know where he was uh, or where he went. And he stayed out in the woods and came in at night to his mama's house and came in and snuck around the quarters to stay. Now, don't you think it's interesting that a little 10 year old boy can live out in the woods by himself all day and all night and not get lost and not get hurt? How's a 10 year old boy going to do that if they haven't been taught? How's a 10 year old boy going to know those land and who did they learn it from and how did those people learn it from? So when they talk about us not knowing our way off the plantation, why people would go out 10, 15, 20 miles to hunt. You had, who do you think drayed and carried all that corn and all that indigo and all that tobacco from the plantation to the city? 
Well, you had people going 30, 40, 50 miles, and you don't think they met the people and knew the land? And that was useful for all kind of things. The hoeing that I, that I talked about at the beginning, why Miss Ellie, Mr. Sandy, everybody doing that yard, doing their work, had a hoe. Hoes were as essential to us that we use them in Africa as they were to as water. The hoe and the land had a special relationship. You didn't mess with somebody's hoe, and you didn't ever bring your hoe inside. You never did that. Why, I don't really know, but I do know that there'd be special places in folks' yards for them to stand their hoe. I do know that when them Africans flew back over to Africa, why they left the hoe standing right there in the field. And I do know that people would say sometimes when somebody was beat and tired and wore out that their hoe actually did the work for them. Now, child, I don't have time to tell you all the stuff about the land, about how we loved the land, that we knew the land was alive, that we respected it, that we knew the spirits and the souls that lived in the land, in the rocks and in the rivers and in the woods, and that they helped us. And if we respected and loved them, they would help us back. The land healed us and helped us as much as our songs, as much as our stories did, because the land responded to us. The land responds to love. And it's like George Washington Carver said, anything that you love will tell you its secrets, anything. And we loved the land and we loved each other and we took care of each other and took care of the land. And with that, Mr. Perkins sat back, took a sip of his mixed drink and said, we'll know more later. Sit back, daughter. So thank you very much for listening to Mr. Perkins and I, and I'm looking forward to the next to the gentleman, Mr. French and Matt. Thank you so much. Hello, uh, Dr. Bui. That was an inspiring talk. Your the, your uh, discussion of the um, the collective knowledge of the land is one that really serves as the, the the new basis for how we're looking at at Montpelier and the larger landscape and the the hoe as a sacred object. That's um, we we find hoes in the archaeology record and they have a new place for us. So thank you. Um, the paper that Mr. French and I are talking about today uh, is how we're using the archaeological record to gain insights into the contributions of Americans enslaved at Montpelier. And Montpelier is a, uh, a plantation that was owned by uh, James Mad three generations of James Madison's family from the 1720s up until the 1840s, and was also home for over 300 enslaved Americans uh, who, who created and, and, and worked this land and, and, the, and the, all the physical spaces during this time period. Now today, Montpelier is a, a 2,650 acre property that's owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation and operated by the Montpelier Foundation. And what, the, um, uh, what visitors experience when they come to Montpelier is really a very small part of this 2,700 acre land mass. And what we're very fortunate to have in this landmass is the core of the Madison Plantation. And in that core, we have three um, periods of spectacularly preserved sites. Each generation of ownership by the Madisons corresponds to a different a change in agricultural uh, tech, uh, techniques that are being worked from uh, the grand grandmothers um, running the plantation as a tobacco farm to uh, James Madison's parents having the enslaved uh, do more traditional farm agriculture with plowing and planting of grains. And then finally, when James Madison takes over the plantation in the 1790s, he enacts more scientific farming. But by the 1820s, he's using Montpelier as, a, as the breeding plantation to sell, invest in human bodies and sell them to the South with the transcontinental slave trade. Now, what, um, what with the sale of Montpelier in 1844 by Dolly Madison, all of the slaves are sold from Montpelier. And with that sale goes the labor, but also the collective knowledge, as Dr. Bowie was talking about. And um, after that, the Montpelier never returns to that to a regular amount of 120 enslaved workers there. It's down to about 25. After emancipation, 
um, the amount of labor and agriculture dwindles even more. And so all these Madison era sites pretty much are abandoned and returned to woods and in some cases are, are, are in fields. And in the 20th century, when there was the greatest danger of these sites being impacted through mechanized plowing, the DuPont family owns Montpelier. And they run this estate as a, a horse farm. And actually today we're having the uh, 80th running of the, um, of the steeplechase. And this is a tradition that actually led to the preservation of all these sites. And so what we've got is a physical landscape that is the memory of these sites. And it's an important memory because what we have fantastic sites, the documentary record was drastically impacted because five years after Dolly, sell, Dolly Madison sells the land, Madison's nieces and nephews find two, literally two rooms full of documents in his stepson's home and burn all these because they want to, they, they, uh, and for whatever, whatever the purpose of that burning, they remove the record of um, agricultural production that is traditionally, you know, in the documentary form recorded by, um, by owners. And what we're left with is the archaeological record, which is really, it's the, it, it, that is the steward of this knowledge of the people. And what we're in a unique opportunity to do is use this, uh, this essentially this material record, the, the record that the, the oppressors never thought would be used to document um, the labor of the enslaved, to challenge the orthodoxy of the traditional narrative of these plantations and the contributions of African Americans and move beyond the characterization of enslaved Americans as property and contributing labor alone. Now, the inspiration for using the archaeological record for looking at late sites of labor comes from the archaeology of the home place that has happened you know be, you know way beyond Montpelier in many homes but at Montpelier we've looked at what's called the south yard the quarters for house slaves we found enough evidence from the architecture to reconstruct these spaces um, in in collaboration with the descendant community and in the field uh, at the farm uh, area below the visitor center we similarly found even though the archaeological evidence for the buildings was very very light we were able to, to establish that these were log structures. But at both sites, what really shows the, uh, that demonstrates the, the um, uh, humanity of the enslaved is the artifactual record. This is where we find the ceramics, the glass, the, uh, the, the dietary remains. And the dietary remains is you know, the topic of what um, uh, Michael Twitty talked about uh, last night where um, the, 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 the food ways of African-Americans not being limited to the quarter, but contributing to what you know is seen as American uh, foodways today. And so what we wanted to do was move beyond the home place and see how uh, enslaved Americans, black Americans contributions was to agricultural enterprise, which is a, you know, a regime that they've been relegated to labor but look at this intellectual contribution. And first we had to find these sites and that's a challenge because what we wanted to find were these outbuildings, the, um, the storage sheds, the tobacco barns, the granaries. And the only thing that's left of these is a very light concentration of nails, but with metal detectors, you're able to find these. And I'll get into that in a second. The other part of this labor, evidence of labor is the fields. And what's left of these in the woods is very subtle linear uh, um, uh, depressions and mounds of edges of fields, uh, uh, plow furrows, but how we're able to pick that up is with LIDAR. So first, starting for locating the buildings, how we've done this is through metal detector survey across Montpelier's 2,700 acres. And what we're doing is we're doing this in a gridded fashion on a 20 meter grid, and we sweep each of these grids with uh, you know, uh, knowledgeable metal detectors who know how to use these machines. And what we're looking for is um, the locations of historic historic objects, mainly nails. And so we sample enough to know where, that the objects we're identifying are historic nails dating to the, to the enslavement period. And then we do a concentration map, this heat map, where green is uh, symbolically not buildings, probably fields. The red is where the buildings and the sites are. And so what this allows us to do is not only find the sites, but with the nails, you can literally date the sites because during the period from the 1760s through the 1840s, nail manufacture goes through four different changes, which correspond with the different periods of occupation by the uh, um, Madison landowners and the changes in agricultural techniques that happen. So we're able to match and build, we've been able to build a chronology of what kind of buildings are being used and what kind of agriculture is happening co combined with some scant documentary evidence. But what this has led 
metal detectorist to call nails, which is usually the bane of a metal detectorist, Montpelier Gold, because it's how we're finding all these buildings. And once we find these buildings, what we do is on the 20 on the 60 on the uh, 20 meter grid we're able to find where the sites are and then what we do is we once we locate these sites we lay out a 10 foot grid and at the site you can see right here in this below up right here you can see on the 20 meter grid the um the the definition of the site is the the, the site area but finding the building is not possible until you lay out a 10 foot grid and all of a sudden those orange and um, yellow uh, um, concentrations are where the building are. So this one happens to be a tobacco barn. The next building on the, this ridge, and this is the, the, um, the, um, uh, the, the case study of the East Woods that I'm focusing on now. Um, the, in the next ridge over, there is another tobacco barn. Uh, the building itself could be seen in this concentration of nails. What allows us to identify this as a tobacco barn is it's located on a, on, a, on a ridge that has good breezes. The yard space is very small. All we located at this site and the previous one is nails. So indicative of there's not a work yard that would be, you know, one that would be used with traditional um, uh, agriculture, such as the next ridge over, which was a, um, a, uh, a threshing barn that we found. Uh, from the concentration of artifacts and from the metal detector surveys actually found um, parts of a threshing machine. And this threshing machine, which was in a building that we located, was located on a broad flat area. And there, there are enough other nail concentrations that suggest there are other buildings at this site, probably granaries. And this is probably the main farm complex for this portion of the 5,000 acre, um, uh, 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 um, this farm uh, quadrant of the 5,000 acre larger plantations of, of, the, of Montpelier. Because back in the day, a 5,000 acre plantation would be divided into subsections and each of those subsections worked independently. Now, immediately adjacent to this ridge, what we located was a slave quarter. And what it turned out is that the where the nail concentration was and the artifact concentration was, wasn't where the building is. That was shown by the presence of a chimney base that had survived. Remember, these are all unplowed contexts that were abandoned in the 1840s and 50s. Where the, the red area is here was where we were finding uh, items such as scissor blades, thimbles, buttons, all indicative of a um, of a, um, uh, a living spot. Um, now, one of the other sites we recently just found is probably a log structure with a stick and with a um, with a, a stone and brick chimney. Now, one of the other sites we recently identified and survey is an area where we found a, a few nails, but then lots of cooking pot fragments. And the, the the this isn't a spot that was being occupied, but probably was a cook shed that was used for the midday meal. By, uh, by laborers out in the fields. And putting all these sites together, what we've got is a farm, uh, you know, a portion of this farm that includes the slave quarter, the uh, threshing barn and, and threshing complex, uh, the tobacco barns, and then the, uh, this cook shed for, for the midday meal. But then what's missing is the fields. And so what the question was is if you got a tobacco barn, where are they growing tobacco in what would be an eroded uh, upland area? And the LIDAR began to show that. Now, what the LIDAR allows us to do is pick out all of the all, all these features that are related to the fields, everything from field edges to property lines that were also um, uh, um, uh, field edges as well, plow furrows, and then also erosional gullies and agricultural uh, ditches. And when you combine this LIDAR study with the, well, actually, when you first just look at how the LIDAR study reveals about the property, there are over 1,500 18th and 19th century features that are across the Montpelier landscape. So it really demonstrates every inch of the Montpelier landscape had been farmed and intensively used in the 18th and 19th century uh, by, by enslaved Americans. Now, when you combine this with the metal detector survey of where the buildings are, what you get is a complete picture of this farm complex that, you know, in terms of the material remains of it. And what I'm going to do right now is jump back into the East Woods and look what the LIDAR has to show. So with the LIDAR of the East Woods, what was most prominent on the landscape, you, you know, you literally could walk down these gullies, but it really showed up with the LIDAR was these erosional gullies. And what we've been able to figure out is these erosional gullies come from the earlier uh, uh, 18th century plowing of the uplands that was what was what was the technique that was used was called up and down plowing or directional plowing 
against the, the contours, which led to massive erosional gullies where all the soils from these uplands was ended up washing down into these bottomlands and creating some very rich agricultural soil that could only be used if these bottom areas were drained. And what we found in the uh, LIDAR, these light blue are these irrigation or are these drainage ditches that are still evident today. And what's amazing about these drainage ditches is they surround an area where you can literally see the last set of plow furrows, these orange lines that are in the ground. You can't see them out on the landscape, but you can see them in LIDAR. What's more, when you're down in these areas today, some 160 years after these areas were abandoned, these drainage ditches still successfully drain these areas. So there's never flooding. You never, you, there's no evidence of water flooding and create, you know, catching leaves around the, uh, up around the bushes. And then all of the full, all of the uh, trees in this area are typical of the uplands. There's no sycamores. So it's not a wet area. It's still well drained. And this is something that Madison was struggling with in the 18 teens. He's writing letters to his fellow enslavers asking, how do you drain these lowlands where I want to plant tobacco? And what they come back and say is put in underground drains that are, that are covered over by stone and never erode. Well, when you look at what happened down in this landscape, he didn't do that because there, there's no, not enough stone at Montpelier to cover these. So what, um, what we're, what we're um, uh, looking at in this area is black engineering where you know the landscape and you know where the waterways are, uh, are um, coursing through this area, know where to put catchment basins. And you're also working with a group of people that knew how to move soil because this is evident in the, uh, the roads uh, that are out there where the, the, uh, the, um, these shouldered roads continue to be used today even though they, they're not maintained. So you, people have a working knowledge of the landscape, how the water runs and how to, how to create these soil features. Now, in addition to these, what we've also got with this, the, the complex between LIDAR and, um, and the uh, metal detector surveys is the physical trees themselves. We have witness trees that date to the Madison era. And these are everything from tulip, you know, field grown tulip poplars to field edges marked by oaks. And then pine tree carcasses from the um, from when the fields were abandoned. And one particular set of trees was very enlightening to us because it's a set of double uh, tulip poplars that mark what was a property line uh, in the 1840s. And based on the dendro of these trees, these trees were uh, first sprouted in around the 1790s. And when you look at this property line, this yellow area here marks where this tree line is and it matches with a, a property that was sold in the 1840s that encompasses this farm complex that I was just talking about. And it, um, and, and it uh, is um, uh, one that um, uh, includes and defines what this sub part of the farm was back in Madison's day. Now, when I was talking about this, this project with, uh, with James French and, and, and earlier with other members of the descendant community, but with James French, he was asking about, you know, why was this area abandoned? You know, in the 18, 1840s, 1850s, when the people were removed, the laborers were removed from this land by sale, why wasn't the, why wasn't the next group picked up to do this? And I said, well, the labor was gone. And, and what James came back with was, you know, the, sure, the labor was gone, but then also the knowledge base was gone. And what this question really challenged um, us to do is start to begin to expand our analysis of these landscapes to include what the black intellectual contributions were and, and move, move black intellectual contributions from just being the, the, the venue of vernacular and folk life, the periphery, to really looking at, at the core, such as this, these agricultural um, operations that have traditionally been seen as the exclusive domain of white elite. And um, what uh, I'm, I'm gonna pass the uh, show over to James next, and he's gonna talk about how he's, he's helping us really began, begin to expand our, um, our horizons and, on all of, the, all of these studies. Thank you, Matt, um, and thank you, everyone. I, I, I'm honored to be here today. So um, what I want to do here is to look a little bit, pull back the lens and look at this region, which is really a landscape uh, in and of itself uh, in which Montpelier sits. Now, you'll see on this map, uh, you have two large towns, Fredericksburg and Richmond. This is the Piedmont region of uh, of central virginia the region between the the kind of the coastal plain and the blue ridge mountains uh 
Um, and the region is kind of defined by rivers that uh, flow from the mountains to the sea, and they and 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 Richmond and Fredericksburg are um, are the river heads, where in other words, the ports uh, that uh, all in in the in in this early era, all of the tobacco and agricultural products that were products of enslaved labor, they would uh, be shipped to markets through Fredericksburg and Richmond. And you'll see that Montpelier is uh, along a chain of smaller mountains, a little bit to the east of the Blue Ridge Mountains. And these mountains are called the Southwest Mountains. When you look at this, um, you'll see that Montpelier is one farm in a landscape um, that is um, essentially uh, known for its rich soils and its agricultural potential. And the soils are the, the uh, Davidson clay loam. And um, it's, it's, it, you know, it's Montpelier wasn't put there haphazardly. It, it, it occupies uh, a very strategic location for this region. And that there are many other sites that are very similar to Montpelier, other plantations, uh, some in, in Barbersville, where the Barber uh, Mansion uh, sits today, uh, where my ancestors were enslaved. And then you have Monticello a little bit further to the southwest, uh, all along this uh, region. And this land, as I said, is connected by the, ri the rivers, the geology, um, but most importantly, it's connected by enslaved communities um, who interacted across property li lines. So um, it's often uh, in, in, in the current orthodox historiography, we don't uh, learn about the uh, families who crossed over uh, the, the boundaries, the property boundaries of slave owners. We think of them as being kind of confined to specific land. Um, but uh, they're also, this landscape is also interconnected by the knowledge that was uh, transmitted by these enslaved communities. And, and, and that knowledge now is beginning to be, um, to be uh, looked at and uh, and Matt just uh, talked uh, earlier about um, about uh, some evidence from the ground of this knowledge base in terms of hydrological engineering that essentially the enslaved laborers brought with them from Africa uh, to to this landscape and 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 passed down over generations. Three hundred people were enslaved in Montpelier for over 140 years. And essentially, the knowledge came from them, and that is the challenge of the of the historiography. And we're going to get into that in just a, a second. So, what the Montpelier Descendants Committee has done is we have kind of we're looking at this landscape, uh, the region, but it's really a landscape as containing several different community sites. And we recently um, were very fortunate to win a grant from the National Trust African American Cultural. Heritage Action Fund to design in this landscape a new national trail that will connect them these sites of enslavement, uh, these 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 former communities, um, and so that people can physically experience by hiking and and camping, connect connect these um, these these communities as they may have been experienced when they were still active. Um, and so um, it, it will be this national trail, this design project, if you will, will uh, allow the public to experience not only uh, the communities, but also the science that will uh, continue to, uh, to, to, to be sponsored and, to, and, and in a live form. So we're hoping that we can find uh, many other uh, uh, Matt Reeves and 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 copy and paste that type of expertise all along the trail and for the public to be able to experience it. And that presents a, a huge opportunity for landscape design because essentially you have to choose how we're going to allow uh, the public to experience this landscape uh, and how they can do so and learn, really uh, uh, challenge themselves to learn about the contributions of the enslaved laborers in the actual founding we consider them to be invisible founders. So let's, let's look a little bit um, into, the, um, into how this works from a, from a knowledge perspective. Um, currently, the current orthodoxy um, in, in, uh, that, that Matt kind of uh, talked to uh, 
he 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 spoke of the uh, focus, the uh, the traditional focus on the on the kind of the big house, and he challenged that by looking at the 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 sites of dwellings of the enslaved laborers, um, and um, from that though, uh, the next challenge was well, let's through the through the uh, lidar scans and through the um, metal detector surveys there. Matt was able to shift the focus from the dwelling spaces to the sites of labor. And that is essentially that was that allowed the the the, the evidence to come from ground truthing of disputed knowledge. And, and 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 Matt just gave an example of one of those, which is who owned was it was it Madison, who is revered as the scientific farmer, who had these ideas of of hydrological engineering, or was it the people whom, upon whom he relied for everything, including his ideas, his sustenance, his wealth, his power, and everything? Um, and this is truly disputed knowledge now. And that that dispute is revealed by the archaeology. Um, and, and so that dispute, that knowledge, it feeds uh, the historiography, how, how the... Um, how the story is traditionally told and how it is now evolving. So traditionally, the story focused on the big house, focused, you know, more recently uh, looking at some of the uh, sites of dwelling of enslaved laborers, focused really kind of on the documents of the big house, which is, of course, the Constitution and, and all of that. Um, but now it's evolving towards the, um, the, co the intellectual contributions not just the labor contributions, but the intellectual contributions at every level of the enslaved people who lived there for 140 years. All communities, uh, J uh, James Madison essentially lived in an African-American community. The Madison family was, if you will, uh, outnumbered 24 to one. For every Madison member, there were 24 enslaved laborers. And so it's not just labor that flows from the from the enslaved people to Madison, but it's culture, it is uh, uh, ideas, it is intellect. And we've and, and we won't talk about it today, but there is there's other evidence that shows that some of the books that the Madisons were were reading were found in the homes of the enslaved uh, uh, laborers um, um, uh, decades, centuries labor later. So ideas flowed as well as everything else. Uh, so the historiography is being challenged, and the challenge comes from the ground truthing, and that feeds into the preservation um, uh, of how how questions of preservation of the historic site. Again, currently the the focus had been uh, traditionally on the big house, preservation of the big house, restoring it to its state back in the 1820s. Um, but with this new knowledge, the opportunity now exists to uh, shift that focus, or at least to add to it the preservation of these irrigation gullies that still run clear to this day. And it's really, they're, they're, this is not something that that visitors, that the public today um, are, are aware of and they're not shown, but this will change um, because of the, the, the disputed knowledge and the ground truthing. And then really what the MDC has, has, has uh, the Montpelier Descendants Committee has taken upon itself as its mission is if you're going to, uh, if, if you desire, if your aspiration is to change kind of both the historiography, the preservation, you need the power to do that. Uh, currently, there is, you know, the, the museums such as Montpelier are dominated by, um, you know, very people who look like Madison, the boards uh, who make all the decision. These are actual decision making uh, uh, questions, and that relates to power structures. And these power structures to this day, reflect hierarchical uh, power arrangements that were very much um, the, the very similar to what existed back in Madison's day. And so with this with this new knowledge, the MDC took upon itself to um, to institute what we call um, uh, structural parity. Structural parity is a uh, is an idea where uh, whereby the descendants of these slaves are viewed as the ethical clients. The, the, the people who could be harmed, uh, the representatives of their ancestors, of the ancestors who could be harmed by distortions of the, of the presentation, of the interpretation of history. And so um, structural parity 
allowed us to have the uh, after after we negotiated it, uh, you know, after a two year very intense struggle with this board, uh, lots of resistance. It allows us to name up to fifty percent of the board. Typically, though, what happens is you know there, you 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 kind of go from all white boards to boards where you know the term in 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 the rubric, which is the the scholarship around this, is kind of tokenism boards where you have one or two people who are um, who essentially don't challenge the status quo. But with structural parity, what we are doing is going to we're going to achieve a true uh, diversity, true equal power uh, on the board. Um, the way that we look at the power arrangement is that it's not enough, you know, with apologies to the, to, to, to the Hamilton fans, it's not enough to be in the room where it happened, but you have to have an equal seat at the table. And, and so for you to change the way that the historiography and the preservation and the historic plantation are, are, are done, you need equal power. And that is what we uh, uh, realized very soon after we formed this organization, and that's what we are committed to. We obtained a, um, a change in June 2016 in the, in the bylaws, but since then we are now facing a very severe backlash to its implementation. So we'll see how this goes. Um, so th that change in the power structure then allows us to uh, affect how public history is presented. And public history is really important. Uh, and, you know, the example uh, being that today the public kind of comes and sees the big house and and in the basement you have a, an exhibit called Mere Distinction of Color, which, you know, literally is in the basement, which talks about slavery. It's an award winning uh, uh, ex exhibition. It's worth seeing if you haven't been there. It's a very good one. But again, it's in the basement. And and so um, that that really needs to be changed. And what we are doing is we're saying, no, you know, the arc of enslaved communities um, is, is the gold standard of a public history uh, uh, platform so that we can look at the landscape, not just the house, not just the 2,700 acres, but the ecosystem in which Montpelier existed as a landscape. And that landscape was, um, in the founding era, the most densely populated uh, area of the early United States of enslaved people. That's where the wealth came from. That's where the power uh, came from. So, and once that public history is, um, is, um, is, is, is changed, that orthodoxy is changed, that creates a new demand that feeds back into more archaeology. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. So we, we feel that this is a very important a uh, uh, challenge of our orthodoxy because it will create new demand for the science and uh, it will um, feed back into uh, shifting power uh, arrangements. Um, and that's it. And I'd like to thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Matthew and James and Anne. Um, and uh, I want to uh, just Thank you for those incredible uh, com um, present presentations. I learned so much. I have so many scribbles here and so many points of connection across the uh, presentations. Um, I think uh, what I'll do now is I'll let you maybe pick up on a thread that, um, on a point that uh, you were making toward the end of your presentation, James. Well, welcome back, Anne. Um, Thank you. Actually, I will um, I will start with another question, <laughs> a question that allows us to think across the presentations, uh, which were again brilliant. Um, a theme or a trope that came up um, that I was fascinated by is that both of your all, or all three of your presentations uh, gave us a way to think about reading landscape, um, or what you called and um, reading the earth, right? Um, but doing it from different perspectives, from different um, sort of scales and geographies of power. Um, and it seemed to me that one of the um, uh, uh, sort of cent the central goals, right, of uh, having a conversation of reading the landscape, I think, uh, and you, you, you said that Miss Ellie could read the landscape or read the earth like a book, uh, that one of the goals of that, right, is to um, do what uh, 
James and Matthew said, which is to recognize the intellectual contributions of enslaved Africans, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk to us um, about the ways that you are thinking about reading landscapes uh, methodologically um, and um, also as a mode of like uh, of, of an alternative um, uh, knowledge production, uh, right? Uh, of telling the story of these locales, of these spaces, uh, from the invisible founders, I believe is the term that you use, James. So I'd love to hear you all talk about the significance of reading landscapes. I I could start. I would. I've, I've been inspired by uh, many friendships, including with with James. Uh, one friendship that really uh, brought this to mind in terms of the living environment that's out in the woods today um, is wildlife, birds. And, uh, you know, traditionally you think about being out in the woods, and this is how the woods were interpreted at Montpelier for years, is, you know, Madison had this address to the Albemarle Agricultural Society in 1818, where he talked about the, the horrors of all the trees being cut down and how he wanted to save them, and it was important. And it was an important address. But... 20th, 20th century um, uh, land management and interpretation ascribed the forest that we just talked about as being ones that were protected by Madison. So you'd have interpreters going out in these woods in the 90s and the early 2000s and talking about these being unchanged woods while they stood next to an agricultural ditch that was dug by enslaved people. And so, you know, it, it, that orthodoxy just blinded everybody. And when when I when I one of the one person that I shared this landscape with in terms of explorations and ideas was, was Dr. Drew Lana. He's a wildlife biologist down at Clemson. And if you have not uh, look him up on YouTube, he is a poet. He's all, he's a celebrated ornithologist. But we what he talked about when he was on this landscape was how, you know, in looking at the wildlife today, the birds, it gave evidence for what the knowledge base would have been for people who knew the land. How when you hear a bird call, and this was taught to him by his grandmother and from the science as well, is that you could you would be able to know that adjacent set of woods that you couldn't see was a wetland. And the people that would have this knowledge would be the people that were moving through the land. Dr. Lanham is the one that really noted in that bottom land that it was it was a um, I can't remember if he said it was a trophic environment. I can't remember the term. I'm not a wildlife biologist, but he said, Matt. This is a dry environment. This is an upland environment in a in a in a in a lowland setting. This was manufactured. You know who did this, and that's when we started looking at this. And it, it, you know just so the connections that are out there today with the wildlife and the ecology go back to that early period. So what James said as you know as as fa uh, you know founding members of the U.S. I mean it's. It's the it's the founding of the ecology that we've got here in the United States today. There's not a single inch of land in the American South that wasn't touched by slave labor. And so the, you know, the, the cooking, the landscape, the ecology, it's all that legacy. of reading the land i that's a quote from um i love that quote and now i'll have more time to explore it but um one of the things that none of us had a chance to touch on is the fact of the shared um shared relationship to the earth among Europeans, Native Americans, and um, African people of African descent. And I came across this, and um, I'd like to, to share it in terms of an example of how the land is used. Mr. Perkins is uh, talking about um, a wise woman that he knew and, um, and about his grandpa, and she was saying, my grandpa told me stories about how they come over here as indentured servants and got treated damn near as bad as us colored folk. Why we yoked, we worked yoke to yoke, lived together, had children together, and hated the boss man till the money makers got worried and told him they was white. But uh, but anyway, grandpa says they talk about the old country and about Africa, just like you were saying. They talked about the beauty of the land. And one of my grandpa's friends was what they call a wheelwright from over there. As you figure, they made wheels. Told me his daddy taught him what his daddy taught me. He says, he says, Pa said you had to know the soil the timber grew on. Mm -hmm. Said his grandpa told him that beech trees in that county came from such and such a place. And that he could use the wood from certain elm trees just as it came for the hubs for the wheels. And said that 
in this beautiful lush valley, there were some beautiful oaks, but the oaks were no good because they grew too rapidly and the timber from them wouldn't work. And so that a carpenter not only had to know his trees, he also had to knew, know where they grew and what the soil in which they grew would produce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The same thing for a farmer. Anybody that has a garden knows that the light hits different places and that some plants will grow some places in the same yard and they won't grow in the same, in the same yard in another place. So if you're going to adapt to the, the earth, you can't plant the plant where it's not happy. And people who, uh, the knowledge of the earth, they knew where you had to look to find thus and so. You're not going to find nightshade, for example, in the middle of a meadow. You're going to find it in the damp, dark, quiet. You're mm -hmm. not going to find mushrooms in the summertime. You have to go mushroom hunting at the right season. Service berries come for about three weeks at one time in the year. The same with pawpaw seeds. They come for two weeks in the year. And if you don't get them, then you won't get them. So this knowledge of looking at, for example, a pawpaw tree and knowing when, how close they are to ripening or service berries is stuff that people learned and passed on. When they made elixirs and and cures and such, the ingredients were held. Miss Ellie wouldn't tell you her ingredients. Mm. She simply would not. But she knew where to get them. There's one story about a woman who dyed fabric. And um, she said, Miss Rachel knew those woods well enough. If you looked at her, her, her cotton and her wool, she had every color in the rainbow. Green, yellow, blue, red, pink. Mm because she, and they were all from natural dyes, which mm. meant that she knew what tree, what plant, when, and what of it to pick. Um, poke berries, the roots will kill you, but the berries you can eat. Hominy, you can, uh, coffee, Kentucky coffee bean trees have four or five different uses. You can eat hominy, you can also use it to starch clothes, you can also use it to bleach, so that knowledge of not only where and what and who was growing where, when it was growing and which parts of it you could use at which time, because you get the leaves at a different time than you get the roots. So that that knowledge of knowing the land and respecting the land, it's like I use a lot of um, honey locust pods in my work and I have friends that help me look for trees there was one tree on 16th street that grew the most beautiful pods in the world as far as i'm concerned well that tree has not born for three years which means i can't go to target and get pods mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i know where other trees are and other people know how to get trees so i hope that this talks about the knowledge that is learned that is cataloged and that is shared and banked and miss ellie might tell me this part here but not another part. She's certainly not going to take me into her back room where her altar is until she feels I'm ready. And mm -hmm. I didn't use my slides, but Matt, if you can go to that slide where Miss Ellie's altar is, um, it shows uh, all the things on her altar that she references when she's doing her healing and when she's doing her work. Maybe you can't, but um, I'd love to hear the rest of uh, James, what you're going to share, and and synth and I know that Jarvis, you will synthesize it for us all. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I was simply going to add that um, the lands you asked about landscapes and why 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 they are important, Jarvis, and I and I think for me, what's really important is this the central tension in the landscape. So you have this the land you have power structures and property boundaries that contend with the 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 creeks and rivers and the 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 soil structures the uplands and the and the lowlands and that tension you still feel today and it really it 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 reflects property arrangements and power arrangements that go all the way back to the very beginning of this of this country and prior to that property in men property in land um which essentially scar the landscape and they really do in a sense because the landscape is again this rich uh, Davison clay loam, which is some of the most fertile land anywhere on the planet, and um, that the potential of 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 that agriculture is worked 
by uh, you know work work through these 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 arrangements these these boundaries and the people who live there um, uh, their families were not defined by property boundaries white and black so the the white families who were there um, married each other the black families who were there married each other across those boundaries the families were formed in very different circumstances obviously and having access to the landscape was a real privilege not in the sense that we say it today but it, it's to be able to access and to leverage the 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 wealth of that landscape allowed you to amplify your own wealth so what we're trying to do with the mdc actually is to design a trail that will allow people to 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 kind of um, navigate across prop still existing property boundaries today across property boundaries um, and it's, so it, it's, it's a design ex uh, exercise. It's an exercise also in conservation um, and and in and, and just uh, historial historiography to bring people back to understand how the history uh, uh, worked and how people created wealth and power in that early era. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, James. Your uh, comment actually reminds me of, uh, it made me think about something else that I've been grappling with in my own work, but more generally, um, I think is a tension that comes up in studies of the plantation of slavery, of the plantation of scene. Um, it's a term that folks may be familiar with, a newer um, uh, a way to put a kind of finer point on the Anthropocene, uh, right? And thinking about the way that the plantation was and um, a modality of ecological degradation and devastation, right? Um, and so one of the one of the tensions that I've been wrestling with uh, in my own work as it relates to um, um, enslaved Africans and their descendants is, uh, and I and I hear it in you all's presentations uh, as well, is this tension between the fact that you know, I, I was so moved by the conclusion of your presentation, Ms. Bowie, um, where you were talking about love of the land, right? We took care of each other, right? And a kind of mutuality between Black people and land. Uh, at the same time, these were people who were who were coerced, right, to um, uh, to um, uh, farm the land, right, and to engage in monocropping and were coerced to, you know, participate in global capitalist um, um, a degradation of the land. So I'm just curious if you all can talk to us a little bit about that tension um, as you are, you know, um, uh, recovering the intellectual contributions of enslaved Africans and demonstrating the ways that, you know, uh, they are, you know, uh, I believe, uh, uh, Matthew, you uh, mentioned uh, irrigation gullies and and so forth, and so the way that they actually changed the landscape, uh, but also uh, the reality that you know that was a coercive uh, practice, right? Even if it was their own knowledge, right, from uh, agricultural practices in Africa, uh, and, and the fact that um, there was also this other relationship to it that was a deep love for the land um, and growing food and watching things grow. The one potential answer comes from a letter from Dolly Madison to her niece, and she's talking about how her personal uh, slave um, is stealing from her and she wants to sell her, but she can't because this personal slave knows everything that Dolly needs. Mm. And so being an enslaved individual who knows how to work this land, how to do the the, the 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 agriculture, the horticulture, everything that you know, and Dr. Bowie was talking about, um, you're going to become invaluable to the plantation. And so, when it comes time to sell some mm -hmm. people, if if it's a choice between selling someone who is a is a physical laborer and someone who holds the knowledge, and without that knowledge, there's no way to work the land. You know who's going to be chosen. So there's there's a there's a protection, and this is where you know in so many cases. Um, where enslaved individuals had have had the the, the uh, voice in the main house, they would try to get their children to become in, learn the trades of blacksmithing and other trades where it would make them too valuable to be sold. You mm -hmm. couldn't get that, that money back when when that person was sold because that knowledge base would be gone. You know, um, there are a couple of. Uh, I'm so glad we raised the whole notion of the blacksmiths because Mr. Perkins was a blacksmith and his grandfather was a blacksmith. But I often think about that land degradation when, especially with the tobacco crop, mm 
Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. tobacco is one of the worst crops for the land of mm -hmm. almost any crop to be grown. And it depletes, literally sucks the life out of the land in five years. Mm -hmm. But what you do is you go get another plot. And I often think about the people having to work that tobacco land who knew how to take care of it and who knew how to make sure that let it lie fallow for a year or nourish it with the right kinds of compost tin bins that they had on their um, in their cabin yards, but mm -hmm. were not able to do that because of the urge to make money. Right. And it's easier to destroy the land and go make another batch and let nature take its course than it is to um, uh, take care of the land, the land secondary. And uh, the same with blacksmiths and the hoe. Uh, I learned so much about hoeing, and I've always known that hoes are special. Everyone has their own hoe, and I have a hoe. And when I go I, to the uh, hardware store, I do test it in terms of my, my height, how heavy is it, can I hold it properly. And um, blacksmiths in uh, Africa uh, have a long tradition of making tools and weapons, obviously. And it's very well noted that when uh, Europeans came to, um, they didn't know how to grow tobacco. They didn't know how to grow any of this stuff. They were Im initially dependent on Indians as to how to raise tobacco, on Native Americans as to how to raise tobacco and how to plant it. And the hoe was a quintessential tool in Africa. And the whole metallurgy process was one of the blacks, was made the blacksmith a shaman essentially in his village and in his community and that transferred over here too blacksmiths were set aside they worked with land fire water and air all four elements mm -hmm. and they synthesized these elements and created something new and it was a process that was considered um akin to a woman bearing birth and the furnace that they smelt the iron in was akin to, uh, was seen as a woman's body as a womb. And that's where you made the iron. And so that iron was really not merely something posed. First, you had to smelt it, which means first you had to find the ore, which meant you need to know where the ore was. And then you had to smelt it. And there were all kinds of rituals and ceremonies around the smelting process to make sure that you got a good bloom that the blacksmith could use. And that's one of the things that is intangible that uh, in terms of teasing out what we have to what we have to say is that we know based on Native American, based on European practices of blessing the soil of sacred wells. The well at Glastonbury is sacred to this day. Uh, uh, and the rituals around planting, uh, we, we know that enslaved people and vernacular folk from Europe and Native Americans had rituals around everything they did. You would not dare go commence farming on some land and breaking the soil on it without some kind of prayer and acknowledgement of what mm -hmm. you're doing mm -hmm. and, and a blessing for the crops to grow. Now that is something that we will never find in, an, in a dig, but we know that they did it. Why do we know? Because as I said, uh, food was everything and, and the land was alive and you had a relationship with the land. And just as you don't go into somebody's house and walk straight into their refrigerator and start eating their food, you do not go and approach the land and start digging on it as if um, you had no regard for it. The same thing with foraging. Um, the women in uh, everywhere, but uh, there's a beautiful PBS film about women um, uh, in gathering seagrass for baskets in the Charleston area. They know where certain plots are and they rotate going among the plots. They never dig everything else up at the same time. Mm -hmm. If you have a root that you need, like wild ginseng, you cannot take the entire root. And if you're gathering herbs and such and such, you leave some for the next year so that uh, this knowledge about what to do at Gwen uh, is very um, ingrained in the lifestyle. It's a way of life. And one other thing, if I may, um, was reading about how firefighters in Australia and certainly all through the Northwest are now looking to Aboriginal people and to Native Americans as to how to manage the land mm 
so as not to be have it be vulnerable to the kind of firestorms that they're doing because uh, Aborigines, for example, would only hunt when um, at a certain time of the season when animals were there were more animals around is because you don't want to deplete the herd. Mm. Uh, so all of those uh, relationships that people know what to do when you know what to do when a child has colic, you know what to do, da 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 da. You know what to do with the land, and you respect it as an entity that has consequences if you do not respect it as we are all experiencing now there are consequences for mistreating the land right. and climate change is one of them yeah. we we uh, thank you we only have about four minutes left so i'm going to offer up uh one more uh set of set of questions uh, and, and try to direct it to a few of you but anybody can uh respond uh, the first question, um, I'm actually going to join two uh, questions from the chat. Um, uh, they are from uh, Anita H. It's from Rafaela, um, and they are about uh, erosion and water. Uh, so um, uh, Anita asks, where were they draining the water? Um, and Rafaela asks, uh, why were the ridges and furrows not made parallel to the contours to resolve the erosion problem? Uh, so that's one set of questions. And then um, I also just wanted to draw our attention to a similarity that I found, uh, particularly in James's presentation and Ms. Bowie's, around toppling structures of power um, from um, uh, the boards at historic sites and ensuring that there's representation there, right, uh, in James's presentation, uh, to the spiritual and healing power that um, that uh, Ms. Bowie talked about. Um, so if there, is any, if there are any synergies there that you would like to make quick statements about in the last three minutes, please feel, feel free to do so. Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on, on that question real quick and, and hopefully Dr. Bowie will as well. Um, I, yes, there are huge connections between the spiritual power and the, and the power to, um, to, to be the coast equal coast steward of your ancestors histories. And in essence, that's, that's, that is the, um, it's, it's a very, uh, fearful change, but, uh, for, for current power structures, but it seems like it would be uh, more of an, a very obvious thing. Uh, to have the uh, the descendants of those who were enslaved be represented uh, as equals in these power structures. And there's a big difference between representation that is managed by a legacy board uh, as an advisor or a circle of friends or, you know, something of that nature, and equal power, whereby the people who are the descendants sit down at a table as equals and together define the interests of the institution mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. brought in as guests or we'll you know we'll we'll call you when we need you that's a very different relationship and um the claim to legitimacy in that power structure i think has been suppressed for forever really but we are fast approaching an era and hopefully we're going to play a role in this where that new power relationship will seem obvious and 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 there's a lot of scholarship uh going um supporting this right now um dr michael blakey at the college of william and mary uh the rubric which was uh which was uh at montpelier developed there anyway but I, i'd like to hear from dr Bui as well uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for your work. Uh, you you guys are doing some amazing, powerful work, and I really, really appreciate it. I have a friend who's a poet, and she ends her presentations with, and may the ancestors be pleased. And I'm sure that they would be pleased with the work that you are doing. And I'm sure that they're encouraging you on with that work. And I know for a fact that once you begin it, you cannot stop it. They will not allow it, and they will help you do it. So I'm sure that they're pleased and uh, and grateful and appreciative that you are bringing a voice to them. So um, James, uh, uh, Jairus, could I ask you please just to say a little bit more about what you wanted us to speak to? So, um, well, unfortunately, Dr. Bowie, we are out of time. That's what I um, thought. Well, yeah, we're, we're out of time. Yeah, that's what I thought. I the point was about toppling structures of power, and I was really interested uh, and, and was very moved by 
uh, your recognition of uh, of spirituality and healing in your presentation um, when you were uh, talking about Miss 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 Ellie, um, and so I was trying to draw connections between that and sort of James's work around ensuring that there was more equity on the boards and just thinking about um, um, a toppling structures of power at different scales. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, just just in terms of that, that this work, I, I know for many of us who do this work, there is an attachment to it because we feel compelled to it and that we were called to it yes. and that we can't let it go and that the spirituality that undergirds us transcends space and time and that there is power in that. Miss Ellie has power. I hope that James and Matt have a place that they go and some people that they go to when they're sp feeling low that sit them down and tell them don't quit. Yes. Uh, because that will indeed topple and it will indeed make all of us strong enough internally and externally to continue to move forth on something that's obviously very dear to all of us um, and much more so than intellectually so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Bowie. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are out of time, unfortunately. Um, I want to do two things before we wrap. Uh, one is to uh, correct a, a faux pas on my part. I've been referring to Ms. Bowie uh, as Ms. Bowie and not as Dr. Bowie. I read Ms. Bowie in your bio. In your bio um, no worries. No realized, worries. Oh, no. Um, I, I have not. Uh, no worries. You are regarded you appropriately. So Dr. Bowie, uh, James French, Matthew Reeves, thank you all for a really fabulous, fabulous, an inspiring uh, conversation. I'm so deeply moved and, and so grateful uh, for the work that, that each of you is doing um, for the ancestors, but also for the, for the future. So thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.